Black Dahlia, The Murder of Elizabeth Short, 1946. Please subscribe my channel. Dorothy French felt sorry for the attractive young woman who was hanging out at the Aztec Theater in San Diego where she worked. The attractive stranger was 5 feet, 5 inches tall, weighed about 115 pounds, had jet black hair, and green eyes. She had been there for hours on that day in early December 1946, and she appeared to have nowhere else to go. French brought her to the home that she shared with her mother Elvira at Camino Padera in Pacific Beach. There was something both attractive and mysterious about Elizabeth Short. She said little about her past, but did reveal that her fiancé Major Matt Gordon was killed in a plane crash in India a few days after World War II had ended. She had come to Hollywood to become an actress, but like many others before her had ended up working odd jobs, mostly waitress. Short stayed with the Frenches until a red-haired man picked her up on January 8, 1947. He was about 25 years old and drove a light-colored coupe with a Huntington Beach license plate. She was in a good mood as she talked with Bob, and they loaded her two suitcases and hatbox into the trunk of his vehicle. Robert Manley was a salesman who lived with his wife and four-month-old son. Manley and Short spent the night at a San Diego hotel. The next day, she told him that she had to meet her sister at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. When Manley and Short reached Los Angeles at about 5 p.m. on January 9, he brought her to the Greyhound Bus Depot on 7th Street to help her put her hatbox and suitcases in a locker. Then he drove her to the Biltmore Hotel on Olive Street. Built in 1923, this upscale and elegant building featured Spanish-Italian Renaissance architecture. They arrived just after 6 p.m. At Short's request he went to the reception desk and asked if Virginia West had registered at the hotel. The desk clerk replied that no one by that name had checked in. As Manley left the lobby, he glanced over his shoulder at Short. She was wearing a black tailored suit, black stockings, and black high-heeled suede shoes. A light-colored full-length coat was draped over one arm, and she carried a black plastic handbag. Her black clothing contrasted with her soft skin. He had barely left when Short began talking to the clerk at the cigar stand. She stayed in the lobby for about an hour, pacing the marble floor near the telephone booths. It was the last time that anyone saw her alive. Less than a week later, on January 15, 1947, Betty Berzinger was pushing her daughter in a stroller on Norton Avenue between 39th Street and Coliseum when something caught her eye. She did not know what it was but without thinking turned the stroller around to shield her toddler's view. Initially she thought someone had dropped a mannequin in the vacant lot amid the grass and weeds just a few feet from the sidewalk, but then she realized that it was the body of a young woman severed in half. Berzinger crossed the street and knocked on the door of the nearest house. Using the woman's phone, she called the police at 10.40 a.m. a person needs attending to, she said, and then she hung up. When officers arrived at the scene, they found a nude body that had been carefully sliced in half at the waist and drained of blood. It had other cuts and showed signs of mutilation. The victim's face had been slashed from ear to ear, creating an eerie clown-like smile. The two halves of her body appeared to have been carefully posed rather than being hurriedly dumped. Lieutenant Jess Haskins made notes about the wounds and knife marks on the body and the lack of blood at the scene. It was clear that the victim had been killed elsewhere and her murderer had posed her body in plain view. She had been dead about ten hours. Judging by the way in which the body was neatly cut in half, Haskins had the impression that the killer had some knowledge of anatomy and surgery. By now, the trickle of onlookers and curiosity seekers had grown into a steady stream as word of the killing spread. All five Los Angeles daily newspapers had sent reporters to cover the story. According to documents later released by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the press had taken photos at the scene before the police had done so. When the Los Angeles Examiner heard about the killing of a beautiful girl severed at the waist, they sent every available reporter and photographer to the scene. Fiend tortures, kills girl, the Examiner's headline blared. The story of the murder would stay on the front page of the newspaper for the next 35 days. 
the body that had been severed and was seemingly put on display had captured the public's attention. Police took the woman's fingerprints. They had no idea who she was and hoped that the FBI in Washington, D.C. could help. The police sent the prints to the FBI by airmail special delivery. Warden Woolard, assistant managing editor of the Los Angeles Examiner, picked up the phone and called Jack Donahoe, the Los Angeles Police Department's chief of homicide. He pointed out that it could take a week to identify the victim, giving the killer more time to get away. Woolard suggested sending the fingerprints over the wire, just as the newspaper did with photos. This had never been tried before, but if it worked it would speed up the police's ability to identify the victim. When International News Photo Wire opened at 4 a.m., the prints were sent to the Hearst Newspaper's Washington, D.C. Bureau, where they would be taken off the wire and handed to the FBI. The first attempt to transmit the fingerprints over the telephone wires was not successful, as the prints were too blurry. News Bureau photographer Russ Lapp suggested blowing up each fingerprint and sending them one at a time as 8 by 10 inch images. The FBI's Identification Division in Washington, D.C received a copy of the fingerprints at 11 a.m. on January 16. Less than an hour later, they had identified the victim of the gruesome murder in Los Angeles from among the 104 million fingerprints they had on file at the time. She was Elizabeth Short, age 22, born July 29, 1924, in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. She had two sets of fingerprints on file. The first one was taken when she applied for a job as a clerk at the commissary of the Army's Camp Cook, now Vandenberg Air Force Base, in California on January 30, 1943. She worked there for only a few weeks. The second set of prints stemmed from her arrest on September 23, 1943, for underage drinking at the El Paseo restaurant in Santa Barbara. Policewoman Mary H. Unkefer brought her to the Greyhound bus station and put her on a bus to Boston to go home to her mother Phoebe Short in Medford, Massachusetts. Short returned home, but she came back to California three years later. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover appreciated the examiner's assistance with the case. The action of the Los Angeles examiner in transmitting to the FBI the fingerprints of the unidentified murder victim is an excellent illustration of the cooperation of the press with law enforcement, and it is such cooperation that aids law enforcement in curbing the increase in crime, he said at the time. For its part, the examiner got a scoop, it had the name of the victim ahead of the other newspapers in the country. Armed with the victim's identification, the FBI sent the Los Angeles Police Department a photo of Short and a record of her past employment. They had her mug shot from Santa Barbara police on file and supplied it to reporters. In the 1940s, reporters treated stories as investigations. They hunted down leads and competed with one another to be the first to break a story. The lines between journalists and police were also sometimes blurred, as reporters chased down their own leads, sometimes digging up information ahead of police detectives. As an FBI agent commented, it is not possible for the investigators to have a confidential telephone conversation or even read mail without some news reporter looking it over to see if it relates to this case. The Los Angeles Herald Express and the Los Angeles Examiner, both owned by William Randolph Hearst, were particularly aggressive. Although the five Los Angeles newspapers competed to outscoop each other, there was one line not one of them was ready to cross. They did not print photos of Short's mutilated face nor of her body sliced in two. Those images were considered too shocking, media outlets touched them up to remove signs of violence before printing them. Several of the unretouched photos didn't surface until 1984, when Kenneth Anger's compendium of Hollywood scandals, Hollywood Babylon II, was published. Dr. Frederick Newhar of the Los Angeles Office of the County Coroner performed an autopsy on Short's body the same day that she was identified on January 16. He concluded that Short had died of hemorrhage and shock due to concussion of the brain and lacerations of the face. Her killer had beaten her in the head and sliced up her face while she was still alive, but her skull was not fractured. Other wounds to her body were inflicted post-mortem. Her trunk had been severed by a cut straight through the abdomen. Smears for signs of sperm were negative. The autopsy dispelled subsequent rumors that Short had abnormal genitalia that prevented her from having normal intercourse. 
Nuhar also noticed that Short's lower teeth were in bad shape and her fingernails were chewed to the quick. Detectives questioned Short's relatives, acquaintances, and former boyfriends. Within a few days, police located Short's father. Cleo Short had abandoned the family years earlier and moved to the West Coast. He said that his daughter had stayed with him when she first arrived in California in 1943, but the two had a disagreement and went their separate ways. He said that his daughter was more interested in going out dancing with servicemen than in keeping house and doing dishes. After Short left Santa Barbara in September 1943, she spent the next few years bouncing around between Miami and Massachusetts. While waiting on tables in Miami, she met and fell in love with Major Matthew Gordon. The two were engaged. He fought in the Pacific and survived World War II, only to be killed in a plane crash on August 10, 1945, shortly after Japan had surrendered. In July 1946, Short returned to Hollywood to start her life over again and to see an old boyfriend. She had met Lt. Gordon Fickling in Florida but he was now stationed in Long Beach, California. The relationship did not work out, but the two continued to keep in touch when he moved out of state. She moved repeatedly in the final months of her life, but was often seen in the company of men who picked up her tab at bars and nightclubs. Fickling mailed her money in December 1946. The last letter he received was dated January 8, 1947, a week before her murder. In it, she said she was moving to Chicago to become a fashion model. Shore had come to Hollywood to break into show business, but it was her gruesome murder that would make her famous. She was dubbed the Black Dahlia for her rumored penchant for black clothes. The name was derived from the Veronica Lake slash Alan Ladd movie The Blue Dahlia. Police learned that Robert Manley was the last person to see Shore alive. Detective Sam Flowers and Jasper Wass waited for him to return from a business trip with his boss, Harry Palmer. When the car pulled up, Palmer stepped out of the driver's side and was ordered to freeze. Press photographers snapped away as Manley climbed out of the car slowly, with his hands up, and was frisked by Wass. Police took Manley to the East Side Hollenbeck station instead of Central to avoid reporters. The chief of Homicide Donahoe had set up a polygraph test and a team of investigators to interrogate their main suspect. His wife Harriet greeted him tenderly at the station. Police questioned Manley throughout the night, hoping to extract a confession, but he kept dozing off. An FBI search of Army records revealed that he had been discharged as mentally unfit for service. The LAPD led the investigation, but the FBI performed background checks on possible suspects. Manley admitted that he had stayed with Short at a motel on January 8 on his way to Los Angeles, but nothing had happened, he maintained. The night of her murder he played cards with his wife and friends, Mr. and Mrs. Don Holmes. Police administered a polygraph test, whose use was relatively new to the department. The test measures such physiological responses as a person's pulse, blood pressure, and respiration while they answer a series of questions. It is believed that false responses will produce certain physiological measurements, but the results of Manley's lie detector test were inconclusive. He was escorted to his cell and reporters were camped out nearby, hoping to get a scoop, but Manley wouldn't talk. Police checked autopsy results, administered a second polygraph test later that day, and Manley's friends supported his alibi. He was released. Police were stumped. If Short was last seen alive on January 9th, 1947, what was she doing and where did she go until her body was found on January 15? On January 21, the Los Angeles Police Department issued a bulletin looking for information about her whereabouts the week of January 9 to January 15. A few days later, a man phoned Los Angeles Examiner editor James Richardson about the media coverage of Short's murder. He offered to send you some of the things she had with her when she, shall we say, disappeared? He promised to send a package containing a few items from her handbag. Richardson wasn't sure if it was a hoax. It wasn't. Postal inspectors intercepted a package that was addressed to the examiner. A message that was enclosed was written using letters cut from a newspaper. It said, here is Dahlia's belongings. Letter to follow. The parcel had been wiped with gasoline to erase any traces of fingerprints. 
Inside were photographs, a newspaper clipping of Matt Gordon's obituary, her birth certificate, the bus station claimed check for her luggage, and an address book. The name Mark Hansen was embossed on the cover of the small leather address book. Donahoe thought that the address book was the break he was looking for in the case. The book had more than 75 names inside. Short had lived at Hansen's house on Carlos Avenue from August to October 1946. She had shared a room with Intoth, an actress and Hansen's girlfriend at the time. Hansen had been routinely questioned a week earlier but said that he knew nothing about Short. Police brought Hansen in for questioning again. The middle-aged entrepreneur owned the Florentine Gardens nightclub. This time, he admitted that he had known Short but said that he didn't date her. In fact, she had stolen the address book from him, he said. Detectives found no evidence linking him to the murder. On Sunday, January 26, a handwritten letter was sent to the examiner. Here it is. Turning in Wednesday, January 29, 10 a.m. Had my fun at police. Black Dahlia Avenger. Police waited at the spot that was named, poised to arrest the killer of Elizabeth Short, but nobody turned up. Donahoe believed that the murderer had changed his mind about giving himself up. Another message using letters cut and pasted from the newspaper arrived the next day, have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. Five latent fingerprints were lifted from the letters, but the FBI crime lab found no matches. Meanwhile, confessions were pouring in. Within a few days of the highly publicized murder, eight people stepped forward and claimed to be the killer. Police had withheld certain details of the crime so that they could use the information to help them determine who was the real killer. All the people who confessed were ruled out as suspects. Within a month the LAPD had eliminated 59 suspects, most of whom were confessing Sams. These people ate up valuable police time that could have been spent trying to track down the real killer. Given the neat and clean way in which Short's body was bisected, detectives of the LAPD wondered if the murderer had some medical training. In February 1947, they asked the University of Southern California Medical School to provide a list of their students. The school was in the same neighborhood in which the body was found. The school complied after being assured that the names would not be made public. The FBI conducted background checks but found nothing suspicious or unusual. Despite their dogged digging and investigating, police and reporters began exhausting possible leads within a few weeks. Detectives continued to interrogate possible suspects for another decade, but none led to an arrest for the murder of Elizabeth Short. However, the case did lead Republican Assemblyman C. Don Field to introduce a bill on February 2, 1947, calling for the creation of a sex offender registry. California became the first state in the United States to make the registration of convicted sex offenders mandatory. More than 60 years later, houses now stand on the empty lot where Short's remains were found. But the mystique of the Black Dahlia continues to linger. She was an attractive and mysterious victim who was brutally murdered and given an evocative nickname. She was romanticized as a tragic beauty who led a seemingly nomadic existence and went to Hollywood in search of fame and fortune. It was her tragic end for which she became best known, and her story continues to haunt people's imaginations. Elizabeth Short is long gone, but the mysteries surrounding her death are not.